what we will be doing now in this section is to look at what are the kinds of alternate education methods and programs that have been organized by government as well as non-government organizations to achieve the same objectives. At the end of this session, the learner will be able to describe some of the important educational initiatives for deprived children, apply the core learning from the case studies to critique, modify or design educational programs for deprived children. When we talk of mainstream efforts, essentially we refer to formal schooling and the formal education system, where then children are expected to enter school, take exams and graduate from either school or college and that is what we refer to as the mainstream education system, mainstream efforts. The mainstream efforts might be funded either by the government or by private organizations, but finally they result in children taking exams and going into the formal education stream. So primarily mainstream efforts are those that are taken by governments and are formal. There are often times children who cannot enter the formal stream for various reasons and therefore they remain out of school and the efforts to reach those children take into account their specific situations, take into account why they have been out of school, why they could not enter school and therefore there are alternate classes for them and these we shall refer to as alternate educational initiatives and that is what we shall be covering in this section. The educational interventions as I pointed out are planned to suit specific situations and when we come to each initiative we shall look at what specific situations warranted the setting up of separate schools or classes and so on. These examples have been taken out of a book called Out of School, the Abhyan and the efforts of various organizations including the government to bring out of school children back into school. There might be either problems in enrolling into school, I mean for example there might be occasions where children don't have birth certificates because simply because they were not born in a hospital and therefore the school might not give them admission. There might be situations where the child is working and therefore unable to go to school. I mean the child might be grazing cattle, might be going into the woods with the parents, might to collect firewood, there might be various situations which prevent the child from joining school. The other situation is where the children drop out of school, that is they, they leave school before they can complete say class 1, 2, 3, 4 or even later and that is situation is what we refer to as dropouts. In the first situation what happens is that what we see is that there might be ways of enrolling children simply by overcoming the barriers to, to entry into school. Whereas in the second instance it becomes little more difficult to get them back into school and therefore we need to have back to school campaigns with bridge courses. The bridge courses facilitate the entry of children into school. Quite often what happens is that um, the entry back into school, I mean the child who wants to re-enter the school system might be too old for the class and therefore that bridge course has then to equip the child to enter into say if the child has dropped out in class 3 to re-enter the school system in class 5 and therefore it would be a, a bridge course that covers the syllabus of class 4 entirely. Sarva Shiksha Abhyan is an Abhyan of the government, is a campaign of the government with to get all children into school to provide education to all children. And as part of the Sarva Shiksha Abhyan in Madhya Pradesh, the government started Manav Vikas Kendras in collaboration with NGOs. These human development centers typically would run for 9 to 12 months and they would be vocational bridge courses where during the day the children would be working and in the evening we will look at in the next slide the types of children and the kinds of participants that would attend these classes but typically the children would do a 9 to 12 month vocational bridge course and then come back into the education stream and 80% of that time is, was devoted to academics and some of the content I mean quite often for such courses the content has to be slightly it cannot be completely the school curriculum so while academics is a major part of it other things like social habits, talents, personal hygiene to compensate for what the children, for the education that the children do not get in their homes, the school system also has to provide that kind of education. 
the spread of the Manav Vikas Kendras in Madhya Pradesh is given on the screen. Now, who are the ch children who are participating in the Manav Vikas Kendras? They were child workers engaged in BD rolling. Now, BD rolling is an activity that is actually a family activity. Quite often, it's the woman who goes to the industry and gets the BDs, the tendo leaves to roll and sits at home and rolls the BDs. And that's when the children participate. Anybody who is in the house participates in the BD rolling, including the children. Because the workers are paid according to the number of thousands of BDs that they roll per day. The classes also included children of milkmen and cattle rearers. It's usually the job of, since able-bodied persons are required to work in the fields, it's usually the job of children and elderly people to graze cattle. And that's where children then miss the entire day school to take their cattle around. And this is particularly true from children of milkmen, who are children of dairy farmers, are typically involved in this activity. There are also communities which have low educational levels. For example, in Madhya Pradesh, they spoke about a nomadic community. A nomadic community is one that travels from place to place. They are nomads. They don't have a fixed residence. It might be seasonal traveling or it might be fixed traveling. But the Bilochi community in Madhya Pradesh, classes were also run for their children. There is a community apparently in Madhya Pradesh which is called the Mirasis. Mirasis are musicians who sing at weddings and social functions. And that particular community used not to send their children to school. And the Manavikas Kendras catered to their children as well and provided them an education. When we speak of children in conflict with the law, we are essentially talking about children who might have beaten up other children, children younger than 14 years, who might have beaten up our children who are younger than 14 years, other children, who might have, uh, who might be, uh, you know, might have played truant from school, might be doing something on the roads, might have engaged in petty robbery and theft. And those kinds of children we refer to as children in conflict with the law. And the place where they are put is usually the remand homes in every district. And because we earlier, in earlier times, they used to be referred to as juvenile delinquents. And today we refer to them as children in conflict with the law because we do not want to label them as delinquent. The reason why we don't want to call uh, those children who are in conflict with the law delinquent children and the reason why the terminology has been changed is because we believe in a reformatory system. We believe that people can change, people can give up their bad ways, people can change their habits and therefore since we believe in reform, we believe that children can change and perhaps that they have become the way they are because of their circumstances and that they have been pushed into doing things that they may not have done otherwise. And therefore, we refer to them as children in conflict with the law. Some of the centers that are run by NGOs and the government are residential centers and some are non-residential centers. Now we look at organizations in Orissa and Andhra Pradesh that with ActionAid as part of the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan have run six month residential schools and they primarily cater to migrant children and because their children migrate with their parents and therefore are unable to stay in the sc village school and therefore when they miss six months of their schooling so the schooling is provided wherever their parents work. It's interesting that in Andhra Pradesh the migrants to Andhra Pradesh came from Orissa and they were spread across Nagarangaradi, Medak and Nalgonda districts and there was the issue of language because the children came from Orissa and the schools in Andhra Pradesh were Telugu schools. The schools could not teach Odia. And therefore, the teachers of the schools had to be brought from Orissa for this particular program. The participants were primarily migrant children of migrant brick kiln workers. Now, brick kiln, there is a big story about brick kiln workers that I'd like to share with you. Because there are brick kiln workers all over the country. And we will be coming to some other schools that also cater to children of brick kiln workers. One of the things is that brick kiln work is seasonal. So um, children of brick kilns operate us are usually seasonal and workers migrate from one state to another, in this case from Orissa to Andhra Pradesh. And uh, the brick kiln owners pay some amount of money to the brick kiln workers so that they migrate. So the money is paid in advance in their districts of origin and then they migrate 
and they work through those six months. And then they go back to the villages at the end of those six months. It is a borderline kind of bonded labor that they engage in. Because their labor is paid for in advance, they often don't get adequate facilities in the brickens where they live, where they, when they migrate. And the conditions of living and working are very poor. They're subject to a lot of toxic fumes because in the brick kilns, they have to light fires and to fire the bricks. And that is when it's very backbreaking labor that they have to engage in. This is a similar group uh, that works with brick kiln workers, but it is in Maharashtra. And the schools are called Bonga Shalas. And the organizers of these classes in um, Maharashtra are, are the Vidayak Sansad along with Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Again, the work is seasonal. It's from December to May. So before the monsoons come on, I meaning typically it's after the first season, agricultural season, the workers migrate to uh, the brick kilns around uh, in other districts. And when the monsoon set in, after summer, they come back to do, to do agricultural work and to tend to their farms if they have them. The Bonga Shalas actually run primary school classes. I mean, the syllabus can be very different in different places. In the Bonga Shalas of Maharashtra, what is taught in the schools is actually the primary school syllabus of standard one to four. And the teachers are in residence. They live there and they teach there. And um, the Vidayak Sansad, at that time that this book was written, had about 250 centers in seven blocks of Thane district. And about 3,000 to 4,000 children participated in these classes. And quite often, occupation is very linked to the communities that the, or the castes that the workers belong to. So, for example, in this case, there were children from six indigenous communities, the Varlis, the Katkaris, the Mahadev Kolis, the Malhar Kolis, the Thakurs, and the Koknas. One very important thing to look at here is, like I mentioned earlier, these, the brick kiln workers are often paid in advance and therefore are almost like bonded laborers. And the family itself is kind of bonded, where the entire family has to participate in the work that is carried out at the brick kiln. And uh, therefore, to run such classes, the cooperation of brick kiln owners is absolutely important. Because if they were not to cooperate, the classes would not be able to run at brick kilns. So it's a very delicate balance that has to be achieved between education, so that, I mean, between education and work, so that the brick kiln owners do not banish the family out of the brick kilns. In actual fact, child labor in this country is not permitted by law. And therefore, children ought not to be working at the brick kilns. But it is their, the, their circumstances that the, of the family that drive the children to the brick kilns along with their parents. And they are forced to help their parents. And therefore, alternate education centers have to be run for them. The ideal would be for them to remain in school in their villages and for the parents to have work where they live and live with their children. But that is not the case, and that is what results in children having to move with their families. The story of the Sakhar Shalas of Maharashtra. Sakhar Shala actually means sugar schools. And the name Sakhar Shala comes from uh, the fact that, again, these are migrant workers who migrate from the Maratwada region of Maharashtra to work in uh, the sugar factories. And again, it is seasonal in the non-agricultural period, which is October to April. So after the rain-fed agriculture is done with, they migrate to other districts to work in the sugar factories that are spread across certain parts of Maharashtra, particularly Western Maharashtra. The organization that started running the Sakhar Shalas, uh, the organization is called Janath, and it did it in collaboration with the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. The content of the Sakhar Shala was essentially basic reading, writing, arithmetic, getting sound values in terms of working together, teamwork, uh, democracy, all these kinds of values of honesty. Uh, physical fitness uh, constituted a big part of the school curriculum and preparation for higher education. When we say preparation for higher education, we mean that actually the children, after having gone through these classes, 
take exams of the school and they graduate to the next level. And that is what we mean by preparing for higher education. Maharashtra has large numbers of children who are deprived of education and are children of migrant sugarcane cutters. But in this case, it is not very clear. I mean, the data did not show how many children actually participated in the Janath program. But it is estimated that about 0.13 million of, soccer, of children of migrant sugarcane cutters are deprived of education. Vindam Chaduvukundam is a program in Andhra Pradesh. It's quite interesting. It, it, it means let's sit, let's listen and let's learn. And it's a radio based program essentially for children who are in remote areas. And it functions from, it's seasonal and functions from October to April. And again, it was organized by the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan and the All India Radio. This is actually a marks, this, this program actually is quite interesting because it marks a departure from children having to attend classes, meaning, you know, the formal structured classes that were like the ones we saw at the, the brick kilns or the sugar cane cutters, where there were actually teachers and classes and all. This is a little bit of a departure from that, where the radio, the power of the radio was used for education. The program was full of recitations, uh, songs, stories, and so on. It was very interactive, in, interactive in the sense that although the radio is a one-way um, medium, the listeners would have been able to sing songs along with the program, would have been able to recite along with the radio program, and would be able to listen to stories and talks on the radio program. It was a 90 days program that was carefully designed to address both academic and motivational issues. To motivation to do different things, possibly motivation to continue education, to do things that, to get out of the occupations that perhaps their parents were engaged in, because occupation linked work is something that we have very much in our country, where certain castes, certain communities are required, are expected to do, follow their parents' occupations and are kind of pushed into them as children. The number of centers and the number of out of school children, because the medium of the radio, it's very clear, if you look at the figures here and the figures in the other slides, that the number of children reached through these programs and these centers were very many more than the other programs. I mean, there were a large number of children that were reached through these. And besides these exclusive centers, there were also, rich, uh, you know, there were residential bridge courses, there were non-residential bridge courses. So this actually had a, um, a kind of a, a program that met multiple needs of multiple groups of children. And the participants were primarily child laborers. There is often this idea that is promoted is that, you know, nimble hands are good for work. And when will children learn to do, their, to do work if not with their parents and so on. But we know that if work was so good for children, no parent would send their child to school. All children would be working. But that is not the case in our society. It is very clear that certain classes, certain castes send their children to work and certain other castes and communities and classes Certain classes of people, economic classes of people, send their children to school. And at the end of the day, what happens is that the children who work end up in their parents' occupations or doing some other kind of menial work. And there is a certain class of people that develops that is always better educated and is engaged in intellectual work. And that is something that these educational programs intend to change by ensuring that every child gets the benefit of an education so that he or she can change his or her life and enter occupations that are not those of their parents. That occupations that they choose, occupations that they are qualified for, occupations that transcend the caste barriers, the community barriers of the families and the communities that they belong to. In Karnataka, the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan adopted the model of tent schools. The tent schools ran for about six to eight months and they had a syllabus for children who were already enrolled in school, but at the same time, they were children of migrants, interstate migrants as well. And the bridge course material was supplied in six languages. So when, when I earlier spoke of 
uh, catering to the needs of children in specific situations. We are talking here about customized education programs that cater to the needs of those specific children. So if children were migrating from different states in the country to Karnataka, in the 10 schools, the education was provided in six languages. There were 216 10 schools and there were 6699 children enrolled in the 10 schools. And uh, the districts that covered the 10 schools were Gulbarga, Bangalore, Bellare, Mysore and Dharwad. Quite often, it's not as if the government can run these programs on their own. And in all the programs that I have referred to, non-government organizations, those interested in promoting education in society, those, ensuring, who, those interested in ensuring that every child has the opportunity to go to school. When I speak of opportunity, I have missed out talking about opportunity costs. And when children enter a formal school system, that they, it's very important that, they, that, that we consider the opportunity costs. If government schools are provided free, it's not as if children can just get up and go to those schools. Because the opportunity cost, when we refer to the opportunity cost, essentially what we are saying is that if the child is not earning and in school, there is a loss of wages, a loss of income that actually the parent is foregoing, the family is foregoing, and that is what we refer to as opportunity cost. And in the case of child labor, that opportunity cost is high. And that has to be met either through government support, through support of NGOs and other sections of the community, but it is primarily the government's responsibility to ensure that every child is educated. As we saw in the last section, the government is committed to providing education to every child. So if children cannot attend the regular school and they need to come to the tent schools and get back into the school system through bridge courses, the government has to provide the resources to compensate for the opportunity costs. In the 10 school, there were children of quarry work. Mining, actually, it's very typical. Like I spoke about sugar cane and um, the brick kilns in certain parts. Similarly, in Karnataka, stone quarrying is very common, and Karnataka has iron ore mines, and therefore, uh, and a lot of building activity. And therefore, these schools in Karnataka catered to child laborers, children of migrant workers, children engaged in building and road construction. There are large communities that migrate to build roads across the country. We talk about India developing its infrastructure, and that infrastructure is quite often developed by people who migrate, by communities that migrate to build our roads, our railways, our airports. And that migration comes at a cost to the family. And one of the costs that the family pays for is the education of their children. I mean, one of the costs that the family bears is the education cost of not educating their children. And that cost has to be compensated. What we have seen in this section is that if there is a the intent to educate children and adults, then there can be no barriers. So it is possible to reach children however, whenever, to suit their specific circumstances so that they get an education and are able to re-enter the formal education system. And that is extremely important. It's not enough just to teach the three hours and so on. It is very important that children get the opportunity to enter the form, re-enter the formal school system if they have dropped out and to enter the formal school system if they have never been to school. And one of the things that we see here in this is that there are a variety of experiences that we have covered today of reaching unreached children. Children who live in, live in difficult circumstances, children from families who migrate, children who have been educated at brick kilns, children who have been educated through the radio. And it's very clear that it is the intent to teach and the willingness to learn that is extremely important in achieving the objective of education for all. Thank you.